<laughs> it's time to play with the spaghetti, man. I need to do the electrical wiring. Coming up. Hello, jokes, and welcome back. If you don't know me, my name is Duff, and I'm addicted to rust of the automotive kind. <laughs> so, keeping with the spirit of this budget build, I'm going to be using this pile of salvaged automotive wire to do the wiring on this truck. Scavenge from here what I need, possibly patch and piece together, and come up with something decent. So this video is not a complete how-to video on automotive wiring. It's quite an exhaustive subject. I have done some previous videos about certain aspects of it before. I'll post some links up here on the screen about some videos I've made that you can go and check out later if you want. I will however be sharing certain aspects of this whole wiring scenario with you as they happen and as they come into my mind. <laughs> it's an electrical war zone in here, but I think I might be winning. Such a basic car and still so many wires. I mean, what a mess. It's another view of the chaos here under the dashboard at the moment. <laughs> so I've got the original Nissan fuse box in here, so now I'm just trying to make sense of it all. So this is the diagram for my simple fuse box layout. From battery we go through the main fuse, in my case a 30 amp fuse and I can supply certain loads directly via the individual fuses. So in my case I've got a spare that I might use for the radio or something else. The park and running lights, the air horn, the wiper and the brake stop lights. And then these loads are switched by the ignition, also get this power from that main fuse. So when ignition is switched on, I activate coil, meters, gauges, turn signals, and fuel pump. So I've got nothing on ACC or accessory like I have with a standard ignition switch. I want to keep it as simple as possible and I've never really been much of a fan of the AC, ACC setting on a, on, a, on a switch anyway. More spaghetti coming through the firewall here. Yeah. On the way to the engine and the alternator and the starter and the headlights. <laughs> Going to the coil, down to the headlights and the turn signal here on the left hand side. I got the battery mounted in a simple little tray up there. That's something. <laughs> go anywhere I fasten them down with these P clips they're actually very easy to make I'll put a link up here on the screen to a previous video I did about making these guys if you want to go and check it out same deal here on the left hand side I've got all my wires now nicely hidden inside this sleeving I think the proper name for this stuff is convoluted tubing or something like that and this here contraption that's my main fuses. Let me zoom in and show you what's going on there. So this thick cable goes directly to the battery positive. Then here I've got a 30 amp fuse. And from this side we can then go to the fuse box inside the cab. So power can flow from the battery via this main fuse and on to everything that the house requires. <laughs> this cable 
goes through to the alternator, also a nice thick fat one, and here I've got a 60 amp fuse. So this fuse actually protects the alternator circuit. The alternator can charge the battery and the power will flow via that fuse down through to the battery and also to the main fuse box inside the cab. So I've mounted everything on a piece of Perspex so that it's isolated from the cab itself. I've got this piece of PVC pipe clips over there to close it up with. Don't particularly like the fact that it's white. I might paint it black or something. The source of all my wire is this box of collected bits and pieces. I've also been uh, scavenging some off of the donor truck. And yeah, between the donor truck and my collection here, I seem to be managing to get enough wire together. <laughs> so the auto part stores all cells, this type of connector with the plastic insulation on them. And then you're supposed to crimp them through the plastic with a crimper like this one. And I might add that this is even one of the better ones. Most of the ones they sell are cheap and really crap. So when you've crimped them, they look like this. Now I don't do this. I think it's a bad idea. Because number one, something like this kind of connection is prone to corrosion. And number two, they can actually easily pull off sometimes if they're not crimped. 100% um, and because most of your automotive electric problems are due to bad connections I don't use this at all so I pull that piece of plastic off with a needle nose pliers like I've done here I don't want that anymore <laughs> then I stick my wire in like this and give it that very light nip with the side cutters and then I solder it every single connection I make I solder and when that is done I slide over a piece of heat shrink heat it up a little bit with my lighter and now I have got a proper connection that's not going to give me any problems so with the spade connectors I will put on a second piece of heat shrink to insulate it completely like this one so now it's only open there where the mouthies, I suppose you could call it that. There always comes a time when you have to join some wires, especially if you work with a lot of <laughs> reclaimed wire like I do. So I wrap them together like this, and then you solder that connection, which I'm going to try and do here with the camera so close. Let's see if it's going to work. like that. Next I wrap it with a little bit of insulation tape and I slide over my heat shrink and I will just heat that up with a lighter or a little torch or whatever you use and now you've got a properly connected and properly insulated joint like that. So did I say that I solder every single joint I make and I solder every single connection I make and that way I eliminate 90% probably of electrical problems. <laughs> the places you have to crawl into, is this what you would call automotive yoga or something? <laughs> Now I don't have any of the original gauges for the Chevy, but I found this one. It came out of a 55 Commer Superpoise. It was here on my shelves, in my collection. It's got an oil light, it's got a main beam light, it's got a generator light. That's what I need. As for the speedo part, that's not going to work. To match this to that Nissan Gearbox, it's just going to be too much trouble. So I'm not going to bother with that. Um, I will check my speed on my rev counter. <laughs> I'm going to add a El Tipo <laughs> Chinese temperature gauge to the mix. New one. And a little rev counter. That will be the sum total of my engine monitoring instruments. 
So the thread on my aftermarket temperature sending unit is not the same as the original fitting right down there. So I'm just going to tap a new hole for it, which I'm busy doing up here. I've just blocked off the inlet. I've taken off the thermostat housing and I've just stuck a piece of rag in there just to catch all the drillings and the filings. So I've already tapped this. So now my new aftermarket temperature sender unit can go in there. There we go. I had to buy this, uh, what is it, 3 8 18 NPT tap to do that. 586 rands I paid for it. In US dollars, you will have to divide by about 17. It's a shitload of money, but at least now I've got the tap, I suppose. Okay, my wire is proper, properly connected and sleeved. Can't have any chafe problems. Got everything back together again. I think we're good to go. So to fit my gauges, I cut away the original openings and I made up this piece of plate that is tack welded in on the dashboard. And now I will have the vital monitoring, rat rod style. I got water temperature, I got engine revolutions, I got an oil light. The old piece of glass in the speedo was broken. So I went to my local glass shop to get him to cut me a new one. Guess how much they charged me to do that. All of 10 South African rands. That's about 55 US cents. Can you believe it? <laughs> there were two existing holes here. So I've added the start button here. Found an old one in here in one of my boxes. And this is actually my headlight switch. It was an old semi-broken one that I adapted and made work a little bit. And the button is the old bolt head, park lights, headlights. This is my turn signal switch, or blinker switch, or indicator switch. I've used a on-off on toggle switch that I found in one of my magical boxes. Mounted it into this bracket that I built that is clamped onto the steering column. Added a bit of a copper pipe here to give me some extra leverage. And now that's obviously off. On. On. It's not self cancelling <laughs> We are back to basics. So you'll notice there's no conventional ignition switch because I hate keys. So instead down here in a semi-secret spot I've got a toggle switch which will be ignition on and then there's my start button, ignition off. So you only need a few wires to start an old school gas or petrol engine. This is how I wired mine. That's the main battery cable that goes to the starter motor, the thick one. Then also from the battery through that main 30 amp fuse onto the ignition. So when ignition is switched on, I send power through the fuse box inside the cab and onto the coil to activate the coil. And when the switch is closed, I can also send power through to my start button. If I do it this way, it means the start button won't work unless ignition is switched on. So power flows to the start button when I push the start button, this switch closes and I send power through to the solenoid to swing over the starter motor. I start the car, I release the start button, ignition switch remains closed, power continues to flow to the coil. When I want to switch the car off, ignition switch goes open, I interrupt that power flow to the coil, no more spark and the engine dies. <laughs> So I'm going to add another toggle switch in series with this one, but in a more secret spot. And that will be my additional safety measure. So unless you put that switch on first, this one will not work. Um, that will be a way <laughs> to prevent strange people from starting my car and driving off in it. Not that anybody would want to steal such a conspicuous rusty piece of crap. 
And that's it for flight control. This one here has got no job, but it's pretty. So I'm leaving it right there. Maybe in the future it can do something. These two here are just hole fillers. They got no job either. Um, I don't have a wiper switch because I don't have any wipers. I might do something about that in the future. And I don't have a horn button because I'm planning to do an overhead thing that you can pull just like the big trucks. <laughs> so now I've just got to finish up the spaghetti business down there. And then it'll be all sorted. Good luck to me. So this is going to be the moment of final truth. I'm about to connect the positive for the first time. All my wiring is done. I've checked it as best as I can. So if I connect this, there shouldn't be any sparks. And there isn't any. <laughs> if you see a big spark when you do this, there's a dead shot somewhere. If you see a small little spark when you do this, there's something that is probably on and requiring power. So that's a good start. No sparks. Okay, test number two. If I throw my ignition switch, I should see some warning lights and I should see my two gauges move. Let's give it a shot. Oh, awesome. I can see my rev counter activating. I did see my uh, temperature gauge moving. I've got my oil light, warning light burning. I've got my alternator warning light burning. If this wasn't happening, there, were, there would have been a problem somewhere and I would have to do some fault finding. So let's hit the start button and see if the engine turns over. Fantastic. We're on track here, I like it. Now this is how I wire the oil pressure warning light. So from the oil pressure sensor directly to the one side of the bulb, from the other side of the bulb, through the fuse box to the ignition switch. This is the fuse box inside the cab. Ignition switch gets power from the battery, positive power through the main fuse. So when I close the ignition switch, switch the ignition on, I supply power through to the bulb. The bulb is earthed through the oil pressure sensor. There, remember the battery is also earthed to the engine and the frame. And therefore the bulb will burn. When we get oil pressure, the switch opens. It's basically just a switch which opens with enough pressure. So it interrupts the circuit here. And my oil pressure warning light goes off. The wiring diagram for the alternator light is exactly the same except this wire goes to the alternator let's just confirm that we are getting power through to the coil resistor here this is the old one from the nissan it was working well so was the coil so it should be fine so if i measure between ground and this point here i should be getting a voltage Yes, 12.19 volts, battery is a little flat maybe, but we are getting power coming through with ignition switched on, fantastic. Let's try park lights, they should come out on even though ignition is off. First click on my headlight switch, oh awesome, got my gauges lighting up, very weak in there but it's there. Let's go see if the actual park lights themselves are working. Park lights on, yes I can see the reflection, park lights off, I think my mates in the states actually call them running lights, but I could be wrong. Let's check out the tail lights, park lights or running lights on, yes they're working, I can see them reflecting against the wall, and my number plate lights should also be working, cops here in South Africa are quite anal about number plate lights, so I've got one. So while we've got that, let's see if the brake lights work. Yes, man. So that there is my brake light switch. I actually stole it out of one of the wrecks standing in my yard. So now when you step on the brakes, the switch closes and then the brake lights or stop lights work. 
So stop light or brake light wiring is pretty simple. I haven't got a technician switched. So it's connected directly to battery supply. Battery power flows through the main fuse to the fuse box. From there on to the brake light switch which is mounted on the pedal assembly. So when you step on the brakes the switch closes and power flows to each of the lamps in the back. Pretty straightforward. The fuse here is basically to protect the circuit. Okay, let's try the turn signals. Yes, that one's working. And that one's working. Fantastic. And the running lights or park lights just for good measure. <laughs> and this is how I wired my turn signals. Battery is earth to frame an engine. <laughs> Positive power flows to the main fuse. From there on to the ignition. So the indicators or turn signals can only work when ignition is switched on. So ignition switched on, power flows via the fuse box and onto the flasher unit. We connect it at the X terminal. And then the L terminal is connected to my three-way switch. Um, so when I switch it to this side, obviously this lamp and this lamp will work. And when I switch it over to this side, obviously this lamp and this lamp will work. They are also earthed to complete the circuit. I don't have an indicator light for my turn signals. Um, I want to keep it as simple as possible. I can hear the flash and flasher unit working. But if you wanted to, you could also wire in an indicator light. Some flasher units got another terminal there for the indicator light. Or you can just pick it up here. So for the turn signals up front, I found these little LED marker lights at my local auto parts store. I just mounted them on simple little brackets in there. This is actually the original position for the turn signals on these trucks as far as I know. Let's switch them on and see if they work. I think that's good enough. <laughs> so I got a bit of a problem with the backup lights or the reverse lights. The switch on the gearbox is busted. And to get in there it's so freaking hard. So I don't think I'm really going to bother to replace it. I might just put in a manual switch. But for now I'm just going to touch it to a life. Let's just see if it works. Yes, man. <laughs> to power my lights in the back, I just ran the length of this 5 core trailer cable, which gives me enough because I've got the brake light, I've got the running lights or park lights, I've got an indicator, I've got another indicator or turn signals, as some like to say, and a final one for my reverse lights. So, this little contraption sitting right here is my headlight dimmer switch. It is the perfect example of how not to make your own headlight dimmer switch and you'll find out why just now. This is just a piece of flattened copper pipe. Here I've got some perspex and some brass bolts. So yes, while my headlight dimmer switch works, this point is connected to the signal from the headlight switch. So when we switch the headlights on, you'll get power coming to this. This point is connected to low beam. That point over there is connected to high beam. So if I do this, I will have low beams. If I do that, I will have high beams. So if you think about this a little bit, you might see what the danger or the problem with it is. And that's the fact that when the headlights are on, this whole lever is actually live. Now it can't shock you. But if you were to have a piece of conductive material and you touch it to the earth to cap, you will definitely see some sparks by a fuse. It's all isolated from the cab itself or insulated. What's the right word? By this piece of perspex, so that's not a problem. Um, so yeah, I know it's not the right way to do it, but you know what? This car is for myself. I know what's going on here. Um, anybody who 
uses this without my permission and causes a problem with a short or something and blows some fuses, they deserve it. <laughs> this is how I wired my dimmer switch. Power can go from the battery through the main fuse and supply its fuse in the fuse box. So it's directly connected to the battery, that's not ignition activated. From there power goes to my light switch, which when I close, supplies power to my dimmer switch. And yeah, if the dimmer switch is in the middle, nothing is happening. So it's actually double switching, because my switch is not an either or switch. But anyway, so if I switch it this way, I activate the low beam relay. And if I switch it that way, I activate the high beam relay. I did not draw the rest of the circuit for the relays. I think the whole drawing would become too complicated. So when I put my light switch on and I switch over from low beam to high beam, you should hear the relay click and back. Park lights, high beam, low beam. It's working. <laughs> Look, I did try and tidy up my wiring here by my fuse box a little bit. And I cut all the ends off of the cable ties. You gotta give me some brownie points for that. So this is my dusty fuse box, kindly donated by my Nissan Hardbody donor truck. This, that's the headlight relay low beam. Headlight relay high beam. There's my flasher unit. And this relay up here is for the air horn. Hey, did I tell you every single joint, lug, connector and terminal on this whole car is soldered. So I'm not going to have any electrical problems in that respect. So last, but definitely not least, one of the most important electrical functions for any half decent trucks. Hey, asshole, get out of my way! <laughs> yep, I decided to treat the old girl to a nice shiny air horn. Um, I actually wanted to mount it on the roof, but the instructions said you should keep it out of the water and the weather. So I thought I'd play it safe and I mounted it here under the hood. So this contraption up here activates my air horn. Air horn. I've got a push button type switch mounted in there. This is a rocker arm from an old valve train assembly. So when you pull on the handle here, the handle, if you can call it that, is <laughs> just an old piece of timing belt tied together with some copper wire and attached to my rocker arm. So now I can pull it and make a big noise. <laughs> Well then, I guess uh, that's it as far as creating pathways for electrons are concerned. That sounds like rocket science stuff, but it is what it is. Um, so yeah, I think I've got enough electricity to have the truck functional. You can always add a few small things down the line, like cabin lights or whatever. So thanks very much for spending time with me out here in the shop. I enjoyed it. Maybe in the next video we can see if we can get the old gold fired up. Until then. Have a good one.